Great. So hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is David Ezer. I'm the Vice President of Programs with Jewish Funders Network and proud to be partnering with JFNA and the General Assembly and, and especially our, our speakers here today from UGA New York. And pleased to welcome you to today's Success Factor session on raising awareness. Hope you had a good experience in your first uh, session earlier. And, and I've just listened through the, the, the program here on the first one. And really, this is it just it's incredible work. And very excited uh, to bring this. So our speakers today are, are both with UJ in New York. We have Ariella Goldfein, the Major Gifts Officer, and Alex Roth Khan, Managing Director of the Caring Department. And so with uh, our, our second here 20 minute success factor, I'm happy to turn it over to Alex to get going. And Ariel, if you want to restart the slideshow, we're, oh, you're already in business. Okay. Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. Uh, wonderful to see all of you. Uh, as, as you just heard, my name is Alex Rothkahn, and I serve as the managing director of what we call the caring department, which is really the human service division of UJA Federation. And I'm here with my colleague, Ariella Goldfein, who is a major gifts officer and works in our capital and special initiatives department. And we're both uh, really excited to chat with you about the work that we're doing. Um, before we dive into what we have done, I just wanted to start with some context, and I believe Ariel has already moved us to the next slide. So just like all of you, uh, poverty is core to our mission. Through targeted grant making in the caring department and through unrestricted core operating dollars that UJA Federation makes available to partner organizations under our umbrella, we allocate $28 million annually to fight poverty. And despite our longstanding efforts, the numbers of those struggling continue to still be so high. There are 3 million New Yorkers living near or below poverty, including more than 500,000 individuals living in poor and near poor Jewish households. We seized the opportunity of our centennial, which was uh, about three years ago, to launch a very special capital campaign focused on fighting poverty, which we call Upward New York. And later on, we're gonna talk about the importance of that name and how name gives life. Uh, Upward New York is composed of two uh, primary components. One, building a one-stop social service hub in two areas, really two hubs, uh, in areas of dense Jewish poverty in our community, and also launching a digital pantry system that allows people to choose food for themselves off of a screen. It's incentivized by a point system, and it links back to a central warehouse. So right off the bat, I can share three reflections with you that really helped position us well to amplify our message. One, as I mentioned, we took advantage of our centennial as a timely milestone when we had um, a great audience around us all the time. We were able to really um, immediately grab people's attention by differentiating this project from our ongoing work through the creation of a second line campaign. We were able to say without bashing ourselves that the 28 million that we are sustaining on an annual basis to ensure basic safety line, safety net services, that's not enough. In creating a second line campaign, we drew the attention of saying, we're really carrying the ship here. We are doing the, we are ensuring through our, our funding, the day-to-day -day work happens to secure a safety net for the community's most vulnerable, but still New Yorkers, please listen, this money, it's not enough. And so we have a specific campaign in addition to annual to address the needs of individuals affected by Jewish poverty. And we have the buy-in from our senior lay leadership and our senior professional team, that this is an organizational priority, that it's not just about raising money for annual, that this work is essential as we look into our next hundred years and we imagine the vision of who we need to be. How will we make it possible? So there's a few things um, that I would say uh, demonstrate the phases of our work. One, gathering information. Two, honing in or really clarifying our message and then sharing that message everywhere 
We share it everywhere we go. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain uh, what each of these phases really represent. Uh, first, you're going to need to combat the myth that poverty is not a problem in the Jewish community. You are going to encounter, you probably do all the time, many people who don't see Jewish poverty, who don't understand it, who believe that it's driven by factors that are inaccurate, if it exists at all. And so it will be critical for you to have data and demographics on hand to make the case as to why this is important. We uh, historically have run a Jewish community study uh, every 10 years. It has a compendium piece specifically on poverty. We're now going to start to do that every two to three years. But um, at the point that we launched this project, we were relying on the uh, decade-wide data. And the strength of that data really helped us to make the case. So we know um, as I mentioned before, that there are over 500,000 individuals living in poor and, near poor and near poor Jewish households. Having the Jewish Community Report enabled us to talk deeply about zip codes, neighborhoods, boroughs, where you will find a preponderance of poor or near poor Russian-speaking seniors, Holocaust survivors, the frail and isolated elderly, the ultra-Orthodox community, single parents, and having the data enables you to explain the nuances of each of those populations and also what has driven them to um, temporary or chronic poverty. Having the information on hand to really paint the picture is essential. Um, nearly every communication that we put out about regarding Upward New York is chock full of data and it helps people to understand the scope and the scale of the challenge. But it's also true that different people process information in different ways. So having stories with you at all time, stories that will um, pull on people's heartstrings, that will enable them to empathize deeply with the client and um, effectively articulate the ROI, the return on investment for the philanthropic dollar on behalf of that client. So if you're able to say client X came in and as a result, we were able to do X, Y, or Z, provide X, Y, or Z intervention and monetize that, explain how that increased cash assets or um, a, put that individual on a path towards self-sufficiency, really explain how the philanthropic dollar is leveraged to enable the client to thrive. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ariella. Thanks, Alex. Um, so once you have data about poverty in your community and you have those stories like Alex was talking about to help illustrate uh, what poverty looks and really feels like, it's important to develop a, a consistent message around that information. So making clear what those challenges are, what those challenges mean for your community, and to then uh, clearly and succinctly explain how you are responding to meet those challenges. And when developing this message, um, it's also important to engage the right stakeholders to really be a part of that process, both so you have their buy-in and support um, in, in that message so that they can become your ambassadors, which you will very much need um, as you begin to get the get word out there about, about this issue. Um, and also recognizing that multiple perspectives ensures you're really hitting the right notes um, uh, so you can engage a real broad audience um, in that message. So, and these stakeholders and, and ambassadors could include uh, senior professional leadership within your organization, uh, respected lay leaders or early stage donors. For us, that was really important in this project. Um, partner agencies, this is a project that we are working on with um, one primary partner in our network, but several others as well. So getting their um, take and buy-in. Um, and also it, it could be worth considering engaging the end user themselves in the process of, of, of your message development. In full transparency, we didn't do that, um, but it's something that's worthwhile to consider. It can be a little challenging, but certainly understand there's value in doing so. Um, and then we've also learned that it's really critical for your message to be consistent. Um, now that we're years into this process, uh, we hear donors talking about the project and have heard from donors asking to learn more. And when they're talking about it, they use a lot of the same language and the key words um, that we use in our messaging, words like hope and dignity and efficiency, um, which, which was great because as, as word spreads and you sort of lose control over what the message can be, the more consistent you are, um, the more likely it is that, um, that the right message is really getting across there. 
Um, so what, we're going to show you a brief video in a, min, in a minute to illustrate how we tell our story. Um, but one final note that Alex sort of mentioned earlier um, with regard to clarifying your message is that how you refer to your work really matters. Um, when we started this project, we called it the Anti-Poverty Initiative, um, which I suppose is descriptive, but not exactly inspiring. And it became very clear um, at some point that we needed to rebrand. It felt like it was, we needed this work to, to be representative of what we were fighting for and not what we were fighting against. And so we did some workshopping and some brainstorming and ended up calling it Upward New York. And I will say pretty immediately, um, people really uh, were drawn to the name. Um, it caught on really quickly, much more quickly than we were anticipating. And it really indicated to us that that aspirational message around this work gave people something meaningful to rally around. Um, and that sort of buzz and enthusiasm surrounding the project has really uh, sort of catapulted us to a new level. Um, and we've been able to, to really um, stay on that path, um, which has been fabulous. So with all of that in mind, We'll show you a brief video that's one example of how we were able to distill our story and share it in a way that that we think is sort of a clear and compelling uh, way to engage the viewer in the development of this project. So here we go. UJA has been fighting poverty for over 100 years. It's core to who we are. It's in our DNA. And while we've helped millions of people, we know that there are still so many people who are struggling to make ends meet. Before the pandemic hit, we were looking at nearly 2 million New Yorkers living below the poverty line. Over 500,000 Jews in our community. This is unacceptable. Recognizing that these numbers were not shrinking, we at UJA knew that we needed to respond. We needed to do more. We looked back at the work that we've done. We looked forward to the vision that we had for the community. We thought boldly and creatively. That's why several years ago, we launched an initiative called Upward New York launching a digital food pantry system that we can deploy throughout our network to allow people to choose for themselves the food that's best for them and their families. And we decided to build two hubs in areas of dense Jewish poverty, one-stop social service centers to help as many people as we can with as many services as possible. Together with the architects and our partners at Common Point Queens, we envisioned a space that would allow people to get trained for jobs, access to food through a digital food pantry, legal services, financial counseling, mental health services, access to interest-free loans. By putting together all of these services under one roof, we know we're making it as easy as possible for people to get the help that they need. It's about hope. It's about dignity. It's about opportunity, a way upward. As this pandemic, as this crisis continues to evolve, the opening of this hub could not come at a more opportune time. Unemployment rates have skyrocketed in our city. We are looking at double the amount of people that are food insecure. The challenges facing those in poverty have only been exacerbated by this crisis. There is an incredible amount of emotional and mental stress that people deal with. And the social isolation that so many are feeling, it, it becomes that much harder. This hub can not only meet the challenges of this particular moment, but can meet the ongoing challenges that we know so many will continue to face. Having a hub like this will make an incredible difference in so many people's lives. And it's because of you. Sorry about that. Um, it is always awkward to share a video that you're in, so I will just move quickly along and say, um, once you have that sort of message down, um, it's really about sharing it and getting it out there and thinking expansively about how to do that. Um, so first it's thinking about how to share your story and the different media that you can use. So you have a full toolbox of tools uh, that you can pull on depending on the context. That's about brochures, proposals, videos of different lengths, uh, template talking points. And the more that you can template this information, the easier it will be for you to respond um, quickly uh, to, to interest. And um, the more that you ensure that you're getting that consistent message out there. 
Um, then it's really about where to share your message. So inter internally, taking advantage of every opportunity you can to, to tell your story or to show your story, speaking in committee meetings, featuring the videos in different uh, uh, ev events, both large and small, including updates about the project and email communications. And all of this is really critical. And we've learned um, there's never too much information you can share when it comes to trying to get the word out there. Um, and it's also about finding ways to more immersively engage people with the, with the work. Um, so either in person or virtually now, um, these could be site visits, um, including virtual site visits where people can really see and feel uh, the work firsthand. Um, and you can package, you know, by doing so, you're also then able to package that immersive experience in the narrative of, uh, of the work so that people walk away with a coherent story about what it is that they just experienced. Externally, it's thinking about how you can broaden the audience of people who are engaging with you to identify new but possible funding prospects and also position yourselves as leader, leaders in the field. So writing op-eds or articles that can be published on different platforms, partnering with like-minded organizations on events or co-authoring articles together. That way you're taking advantage of an already captive audience that isn't your own. Um, you can consider how to garner media attention um, for example, on Thanksgiving, we try to feature a story we have in the past, feature a story about some of our digital food pantries and how they're providing kosher turkeys for people for the holiday. And it's, a, it's really a timely opportunity to highlight the work and how the digital pantry system operates. Um, you can host convenings uh, geared towards engaging um, other relevant players in the field. So uh, government officials, foundations, other nonprofit professionals that demonstrates uh, to the broader community how critical this work is uh, to your mission. It positions you as leaders, and it really signals to the philanthropic community that you have something that's worthy of investment. Um, we did this several years ago. You can see an ad for it here, Tackling Poverty Today. We hosted a poverty convening that brought together over 200 people, federation donors, government officials, um, professionals and lay leaders from a whole range of, of anti-poverty organizations, both Jewish and non. Um, and that was another time, in addition to changing our name, that really helped elevate uh, this issue and take, take this work really to another level um, and engage even more people in, in this work. Um, and the last point that I'd make, and I know we're short on time, is really that um, your message in, in its entirety might and not always be relevant for every audience you're speaking to. You can tailor your message to the audience, and that means you can dial up or dial down different parts of the project depending on who you're talking to. So if you're speaking, you know, for example, for me, when I'm speaking to a group of healthcare professionals, I talk a lot more about the digital pantry system and how it incentivizes healthy choices than I'll talk about the legal services or financial counseling that's also a core piece of this project. Um, this is true also when it comes to the Jewish focus of our work. Um, our, our work is very much, it's designed to meet the needs of the Jewish community, but it's open to anyone. We are committed to, to really both aspects and depending on the audience, we will either dial up the Jewish or dial it down. Um, so I know we've just talked a lot at you and happy to answer any questions you might have. Someone has to have a question. There's got to be at least one, right? Okay, Ariella, I'm going to ask you a question. Yes, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> what, what has surprised you most about um, trying to raise visibility for this work and either reticence from the donor community to get involved or uh, times that it has been really easy to ensure and promote engagement? Great question, Alex. So um, I would say the numbers are generally what people are shocked by and that having those data at our fingertips has made an incredible difference to like, to, to, to bust that myth that Jewish poverty does not exist. And I think when we first sort of start our story with that, the response is generally, what? I had no idea. Um, and that sort of, that 
is really a hook to engaging people in, um, in what we're doing in order to respond to that. Um, so that surprised me just, you know, in a sense, we've been doing this for so long and tell the story, you sometimes get immune to it. Um, but hearing people's reaction um, is, is never stops being, being really powerful. Um, so yeah, that's what I say. Looks like there's a question in the chat uh, from Lisa. She says, uh, can you explain a little bit about how your digital pantry works? Do you want to take that or would you like me to? Sure. Um, so the digital pantry, it's a cloud-based system that people can really access from anywhere. Um, it uses a point system. So families are allocated a certain number of points that they can spend in a month, depending on the size of their family. And they can log on and choose from a uh, different uh, categories of food, like grains, proteins, fruits, and vegetables, to be sure that they're ge getting, you know, a balanced sort of package of food. Um, and uh, healthy choices are incentivized through the system. So healthier, so for example, whole wheat pasta costs fewer points than white pasta. So your points will actually take you farther if you're choosing healthier options as opposed to our food system, which works very much the opposite. Um, and um, it can be accessed from anywhere. Like I said, one of the best parts about this is that it makes it much more convenient. Um, you can pick, uh, choose a, a time to pick up your package. So for the single mom that's working two jobs and dealing with you know, shuttling her kids to childcare, to be able to pick up her package you know, at six o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock at night when she's go coming or going, um, makes it a lot easier for her to get the food that she needs instead of waiting in a line you know, at 12 o'clock PM in the middle of the day when she's at work and, and doesn't have easy vacation time. Um, very quick synopsis. Alex, did I miss anything? Yeah, um, no, but I wanted to add um, in relation to what this uh, breakout is all about, you know, the digital pantry is really a game changer here for us. Uh, it has enabled us to uh, almost quadruple our client base in some cases uh, because the access is so easy. And part of how we amplify the story and really get it out is to partner with our government relations colleagues so that they're constantly sharing the successes uh, with elected officials and in Albany to the degree that um, I'm sure all of you across the country and throughout North America were watching the crazy situation that began here in early March when New Rochelle was shut down and the National Guard was brought in to deliver food. And that then had a ripple effect throughout um, our whole catchment area in which government was delivering food in schools in those first few weeks in March. The governor's office said to us, we heard you have a digital pantry. Can you just get it out? Can you just put screens on people in people's houses and then they'll order food? So first reaction, the governor's calling us. This is amazing. We should do it. And then we quickly realized within a matter of minutes that our food is sourced from that Council on Jewish Poverty. It is uh, by and large the uh, central repository for kosher protein from a uh, food bank in City Harvest. And there's really no need for a kosher warehouse to service New York State, let alone the majority of New Yorkers. Uh, and the system is still fragile. It, it was certainly not uh, tech wise, able to address the needs of a global pandemic for all residents of our state. And if you don't know um, what they call downstate, it's quite far away from upstate New York. But the real point there is that we had done such a great job advocating in regards to the work and sharing the story with elected officials that they knew about it. And they knew to say, at least ask the question, could this work for us? I know we're short on there are other questions. But um, yes, there's another question. Oh, we have lots of questions in the chat. Okay. Well, we're not I'll, have time I'll, sorry, I'll wait just for one, one second. I mean, I've, I've, since we now have a 30 minute break, um, I think it's fine if people want to hang out. If you're willing and people want to hang out and ask questions in chat, we can keep this going. If other people would like to leave, you know, maybe we should just bring a pause so if people do need to go, they can go. I'm putting a link in the chat, which is where everybody will resume at 2.10 Eastern, 11.10 Pacific. Uh, and I think you should have that from your programs and the website as well, but if you need it here. And with that, I mean, I'm happy to leave the leave the room open and you know, everybody can continue, continue chatting. Um, I think that I can quickly answer the question from Nancy and from Linda and Ariella, we could tag team it if you want. Um, and then maybe we'll 
we'll say goodbye for now. Um, Nancy asks, did day schools and synagogues uh, work with us to reach our target audience? So yes, we distribute foods. Uh, we distribute food in pockets of poor and uh, near poor Jewish households. Uh, we promote the services quite significantly in community-based locations. So many area schools, many area uh, synagogues, shuls are connected to the community centers where we have food distribution systems. And I don't mean literally connected, but um, are networked with each other. Uh, so that in a very destigmatizing and normative way, uh, day schools and synagogues can direct people to local entities to receive these types of services uh, and to uh, get food in a way that will not embarrass the household at all. Um, and the second piece, um, Linda asks, do we have a good system that documents what food you have in stock? Yes, so the digital system um, that Ariella described is also connected um, to this central warehouse, which is in Brooklyn, although services close to 30 locations throughout Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island, um, all five boroughs, if you're familiar. So what happens is when a uh, client off of their screen orders said item in Queens or in an area of Brooklyn, in real time, the warehouse knows, because this is an inventory optimization system, the warehouse knows what product is going off the shelf. And now we have data over time that we're able to use at the city level outside of the Jewish community to say, look, if you put eggs in X community and you put legumes as a different source of protein in a different community, you're going to have a usage rate that was far higher than before. So there is like a rumor out there that um, peanut butter for Russians is the food of the dogs. Um, it's just a, a food that they uh, is not part of their culture um, and really frowned on. And now we have data that substantiates if you move it out of uh, Rus primarily Russian speaking communities and into other communities, you're going to see um, a lot more usage of peanut butter. And that type of data has been extremely helpful and it's enabled us to really promote uh, efficiencies across the system and to reduce waste. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. Great to meet everyone. everyone.